McNair gives it to George, running right up the middle. Touchdown! It's a miracle! The safety, now you're one on one with it. Shows why he's the man! In trouble. Sack! Ty Nation, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Finally, back on. Mr. Titan, we have a special guest for our first episode back on for the season. We have a gentleman who's in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame, one Tennessee sports uh, broadcaster for almost uh, 11 times, a gentleman who's covered the Titans for more than 20 years. We have the voice of the Tennessee Titans, Mr. Mike Keith. How you doing, buddy? Good. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Uh, again, how are things in Tennessee? I know that there was uh, there was a couple storms, right? Yeah, it was rough in some places, uh, in particular in southern middle Tennessee, and we're, you know, hoping everybody down there is safe and able to kind of dig out from the, you know, the tornadoes and the high winds and the hail. We had a lot of hail here in Franklin and my goodness, it's been it's been quite the the winter and spring. It, it's uh it's it's crazy because I, I remember when I when I first moved to Texas, I'm like, oh well, I, I came from Florida, so I'm like, yeah, I have to deal with hurricanes, but I I can't I don't know about tornadoes, man. Tornadoes are another story. It's 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 creepy, man. <laughs> yeah, and they could pop up pretty much anywhere around here in the spring. Uh, you know, with a hurricane, you have good warning. Exactly. A week. Uh, with, a, with a tornado, um, you know, the meteorologists are getting better and better at telling us when there is a very real possibility, and they did a great job yesterday, probably saved a lot of lives mm -hmm. if people listen. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, they're just up and going, and here we go. So. Yeah. Hopefully, we're not going to have to deal with those for, for a while. It'd be great if we were done with that for the spring, but we're supposed to get some more weather here this weekend. Oh, that's crazy. Just uh, bundle up and be safe, man. Hopefully, again, like I said, it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. But um, let, let's, let's talk a little bit of the Titans, man. Let's talk about – I mean, we'll get into later on in the show about free agency and what we did, or the splashes we made, and the cuts that we made. But I, I want to ask you before that – how did you, how did you start becoming a sports broadcaster? What was there any inspiration at all? Is it someone that you looked up to when you were little when you started? Yeah, I was second grade. Uh, the guy who did the University of Tennessee, John Ward, and uh, he inspired me to follow sports and to become a sports broadcaster. And then I went to the University of Tennessee, and by my sophomore year, I was working with, him and got to work with him for a total of eleven years. So he was my inspiration and my mentor, and. He's the biggest reason I am where I am today outside of my dad. My dad, of course, really developed my knowledge of sports, and he's the number one influence, but John Ward would be a close second. Gotcha. Was there any sport uh, in particular that you liked to cover the most? Or was there a sport that you liked playing uh, when you were growing up? So I was a baseball player. I played football and I played basketball. I played football into high school. Okay. But I was really a baseball player. I had uh, the opportunity to play college baseball and chose not to because I just wanted to get started. And I mean, I was okay. I, I was, you know, I was a, a good high school player. I was no pro prospect or anything like that, but I was a catcher. Okay. It's hard to find catchers. Absolutely. And so if I'd been a second baseman, no one would have been interested in me or an outfielder. But because I was a catcher, you know, I had a chance to go on and play. And, um, you know, I just decided I didn't really want to do that. I, I decided that I wanted to get into broadcasting, that it's really what I wanted to pursue. And it was hard for a couple of years because I missed the game. Um, my favorite sport when I first got into sports was basketball. Okay. And I still love basketball. I'm a huge basketball fan and, and I love the game and, I love to call it when I get a chance to do it. I don't get that many chances to do it, but I, I really enjoy it. Football was probably number three. 
<laughs> See, it, it's different. Uh -huh. Most of my background in play-by-play -play before I got the Titans job, I had done a lot of football, but mostly on a high school level. I'd done tons of baseball. Okay. I mean, literally, yeah, I mean, I guess literally hundreds, if not thousands of baseball games. And so it really gets you ready to call anything. If you can call baseball, you can call anything. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a real gift to me that I got a chance to do so much college and professional baseball and still do baseball. I've done three regionals for ESPN. Oh, wow. Baton Rouge Regional, the Nashville Regional, and the Deland, Florida Regional. Deland, Florida. So I, I still love doing baseball. Um, I, I like a variety of sports. Football is obviously number one in my life now. I live it. And so I try to know everything I can about it. But, uh, you know, I, I enjoy all sorts of stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, who's your – do you have a, a particular uh, baseball team you, you like to watch or you kind of – like to watch different players again. Now, see, you're trying to make me really happy here because I am a diehard New York Yankees fan. Really? Oh, I love the Yankees. And Mike? I follow the Yankees like crazy. So there we go. I get up every morning and I'm looking for the box scores and I can tell you the lineup and who's pitching tomorrow. And yeah, it's funny because it's a, when you get into this, you get into this job because you're a sports fan. Absolutely. Well, once it becomes your job, you don't get to be as much of a fan as you once did. So it's like my buddy Jim Wyatt is a is a huge Dodger fan. Dodger fan, yeah. The same way I'm a huge Yankee fan. And so you get the you get to be a fan just like you were before you started working in the industry. And it's still a wonderful outlet to remind you why you love it so much. Mm -hmm. And that you're really operating for the fans. I mean, my passion for the Yankees reminds me of things that I need to do for Titans fans. You know, if, if I'm interested in this about the Yankees, then I realize Titans fans are interested in this about the Titans. So by still being a fan, it helps me to do my job better. I think, and I, and I think Jim White would tell you the exact same thing. You don't, you don't ever, 100% get away from that um, when you're a sports writer, a sportscaster, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you probably noticed uh, the murderous row on the, on the top of my... There you go. <laughs> Again, a lot, a lot of people uh, wouldn't know what that meant and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like you, man. I'm a, I'm a big diehard, diehard Yankee fan. Again, I grew, yeah. up, I grew up in Jersey, so I mean, it was... My dad was a Met fan. My uncle was a was a Yankee fan, and they would fight on, on who's taking me what game. I would go to Shea Stadium, or I'd go to the old, you know, Yankee Stadium and stuff like that. But um, it, it was good times, man. That's the great thing about it all. You know, it's um, you you realize. I mean, my job is not important in the whole scheme of life. You know, and as we've seen through COVID, my wife's a nurse. Okay. And, and, you know, doctors and nurses and people who do essential type job, the guys driving the trucks to get the, you know, to get the products into different places, the people working at the grocery stores, you know, there are more important jobs than mine. But in terms of providing an outlet, you know, just an area of enjoyment, you know, that's where I think if you're, Mike Keith or Dave McGinnis or Amy Wells or Jim Wyatt, do it, Rhett Bryan, you're doing what we do, then you're adding that enjoyment for people to kind of get away from what is the real hardcore stuff. And it, it doesn't mean that sports is not important. It, it is. And we take our jobs seriously enough because we, we know it's important. Yes, sir. Just keep in mind, it's not as important as some things. And, I think during the pandemic, it's been reinforced what's really important in our society, but it's also been reinforced that these things that we enjoy that give you a chance to kind of get away from the everyday stresses are a good thing. And to give people a chance to sort of exercise their passions, you know, the Yankee Met thing. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when we play Indianapolis or, you know, we play Jacksonville or we play Houston. I mean, I mean rivalries are good things. It, it really is. It's good for everybody to have that area of interest and, and have it be so much fun and have it be something that you can share with your dad or your uncle or your son or your buddies at work or your, your wife or your sister. Mm-hmm whatever it's it's really a cool thing yeah it's almost like a, a little refresher right is like yeah if, if it, sure if it wasn't like in the the norm like everyone's i guess is trying to get back to the norm and just by little things opening up and stuff and especially like in, in texas and stuff when i went to um the game last year when we played the colts the what was that? i think it was a thursday night game where we lost um uh, that wasn't great yeah yeah that wasn't great uh but even seeing certain people that I usually, when I do go visit Nashville and stuff and just having, it made having lunch at a restaurant feel normal again. And right. I miss that, man. It, it really did. Well, I've missed people, you know, I I've missed, uh, you know, going to the, the grocery store and talking to people about the draft, you know, standing in line. I've got a couple of buddies who work at the Kroger that I go to here in Mendez. They know more about the draft than I do. They know more about the agency than I do. And so they'll sit and quiz me about this guy and this guy and this guy. I love that. Um, at church. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm actually getting to go to church this week for the first time since the pandemic. And I'm excited about that because I enjoy my pastor and I enjoy church. And obviously I get a lot out of it. But also, I'm looking forward to seeing folks. Yep, just talking, catching up. Just, and, and just catching up. And, you know, um, I lost my, my neighbor across the street. He passed away a few weeks ago. And we had not had a chance to, he had a, a, a lung condition, but was a great guy. And we had these opportunities to catch up mm-hmm. that were you know, so great. He'd pull his mower over when I was out mowing and we'd get a chance to talk. And, you know, you just miss that interaction Absolutely. with people. And, and I like, I guess there are people who do my job, but who don't like to talk about sports or talk about the Titans or whatever. I love it. You know, I, I love it because when I got here in 98, nobody wanted to talk about it because no, you know, the whole Oilers thing, there was a lot of question about whether or not it was going to work. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 23 years later, I started this job 23 years ago. If people want to talk to me about the Titans, I'm thrilled and don't take it for granted because I remember when nobody wanted to talk about anything yeah. in relation, and there was question about whether or not it would be a big deal. So that part of the interaction has been something I've really missed. Yeah, uh, pretty much that's how I kind of started this podcast, to be honest with you, uh, uh, Mike. It's just that I, I got tired of talking, uh, just talking about uh, Cowboys. I would go to work. Everyone would talk about the Cowboys. Whether whether they win or lose, it was always the Cowboys. I would mention a little bit about the Titans. The only thing they would ever mention would be Derrick Henry or Tannehill because guess what? That's what the media, that's what ESPN sure. – would put out and I was just like well you know there's Taylor Lewan, there's other people in the team and stuff and I was just like you know what this is kind of frustrating I'm like you know what let me just make a I have a couple of buddies that do YouTube as well Titans related and I started watching them and it was nice because it was a little community that again everyone talked yeah. Titans, and everyone knew exactly what they were talking about and it wasn't about the Cowboys and it wasn't about the Miami Dolphins it was nice yeah. you know and it was something I could relate to and kind of get out of my bubble when everyone's complaining about the Cowboys because, oh, what happened with Dak and what happened to Zeke and they paid too much for Zeke. It was a nice little little outlet um, to go to. So, Fandom is a beautiful thing. You know? really- and that's the whole, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking about this last night. When, when I got here, we, we really started the Titans caravan. And – Larry Stone and Bob Hyatt and I, there was, they had a little bit of a caravan in 98 before I started. Okay. Started one in 99 and it was really crazy. We would, we would get on an RV and drive all over the place. We'd do like 50, 60, 70 stops. And we'd go to big towns and small towns and we'd take these players and we took Coach Fisher. And I mean, 
we did all these kind of uh, crazy things that maybe, I mean, you certainly couldn't do it in COVID, but we would meet people who were just like, what you're talking about, just really into it. And they were, they were like, oh gosh, this player has come to my hometown. And I get a chance to meet him and see him as a human being. And then I get a chance to talk to the broadcasters and we sit and, you know, we would go on the radio and, and go on TV in certain places and do things. But then you just have a chance to stand around and talk about, hey, what is Javon Kirsch like? And Yep, just normal stuff, a normal kind. Right, yeah, what are you going to, now that Eddie George no longer plays for us, who's going to be the running back or what, what's going to happen on defense or whatever, just good, good stuff. And the other thing about that, too, was we not only wanted to go and spend time with those people who were – we we're sort of taking the Titans to them. Mm -hmm. And and the internet was up and running, but it wasn't nearly what it is now. It, the, the, there, there was no social media as we know it now. So those communities, those virtual communities were not there. So we sort of took our community to their community. The other thing we did too, is we said, you know, if we can get out there, if, if I can take Kevin Carter to your hometown, mm -hmm. And, and I can take, you know, Jake Locker, who was the quarterback at the time. If I can take Chris Johnson, if I, you know, all, whoever it was, then there's a good chance if you show up and you have a good experience with Chris Johnson, you're going to be a fan your whole life if you're 9, 10 years old. And, you know, two nights ago, I'm doing a TV shoot. And afterwards, I talked to one of the guys who was part of the crew. He was a huge fan. And he was quizzing me all about the draft. <laughs> His questions immediately showed me he knows more than I do. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sitting there hoping he's not going to ask me something. I don't know. But he said, you know, I used to go to the caravan every year when you came to the post and at Fort Campbell. He was a military brat. His family moved to Fort Campbell. When his dad retired from the military, they stayed in Fort Campbell. So even though he'd lived all over the country, he was a Titans fan, but he was really a Titans fan because he met all those players. And so that made him a hardcore fan to the point that he's like, oh, my buddies and I, we, you know, we'll, we'll lay out the whole draft weekend where – you know, we'll be together, or if we're not, we'll be texting one another to say, hey, here's who we should pick with pick number 100, and I love it. Because before this, I covered the University of Tennessee, and the passion for the University of Tennessee is crazy. It really is. Crazy. And, and it's that way for a lot of SEC schools. It's not just Tennessee, but Tennessee fans are, are nuts. And I said at the time, if we could be half as big as them, the University of Tennessee will be huge. And sure enough, I think, I think we're pretty close to there now. We are getting there, man, because I, I remember going to a, a Titans game. Again, it's funny, though, because I used to go every year. I try to go to at least one or two Titans games, try to go to Nashville. And you, just the progression. I mean, again, my buddy would go. He wasn't a big football fan, but he's like, hey, I like Nashville. I, sure. like, I like, you know, so I'm like, okay, come with me. And it was funny, like, year after year, we saw, I think we started, like, what, 2009? And you just saw the progress of, I remember going to a game, and there would be more Colt fans than Titan fans. And he was like, is this, is this a game? I'm like, yeah. I mean, it's, and I was used to it. But as the years, and as you got more fans, as you, we got, got better and got better and got better, the fans, there was one, I think it was one Monday night game we played the Colts a couple years back. I mean, it was full with Titans. And he goes, man, he's like, we've come a long way. I go, yeah. And he, he ended up becoming a Titans fan because he's go, he goes every, every uh, year with me. But he was like, man, this place is packed with Titans. I'm like, this is how it's supposed to be. That's how That's it's, right. it's supposed to be. And it's great. That's the idea, yes. It's the idea. And, and it's, it's working. And, again, last year was a little bit different again. Like you said, with COVID and stuff, um, it was spaced out. It was nice, though. It wasn't too bad. It, was, it wasn't too crowded. It was just enough people. And like you said, with that whole uh, meeting a player and them becoming your favorite player, my favorite player on the Titans is Gerald McGrath. I met him through social media. He came on the show. Automatically, there was connection, man. He was so, such a nice, humble person. And even that, like, we went to the game together. I, we, we went to the game. He picked me up from the airport. 
And just the fact that I kind of made that leap onto making this show and meeting a, a former Titans player and then actually get, got to hang out with them. It's, it's really cool, man. It's, it's a, uh, it's a blessing. So. Yeah. G Max a good one. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's such a humble guy. And he, he's like, Hey man, when you pick me up from the airport, he's like, where do you want to go? I'm like, I just want to go to the airport and eat, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to, he's like, no, man, we'll go wherever you want. He's like, you want to go uh, where KB's at? I'm like, he's bullying. He's like, yeah, let's go pass by <laughs> whatever you want, man. It was, it was a good time. It was a good time in Nashville. Different. Good stuff. Yeah, again, it, it was when I first went, it was just me by myself going to Nashville because I was the only Titan fan and I would, you know, talk to people here and there, but you know, as you make friends, as you, you know, meet, random people and you kind of build that relationship now i go there and it's like my second home i love it you know and that's what that's what that's counts. good to hear yeah great story yeah man so let, let's let's talk a little bit about i had a, a couple of my friends are like oh you had my keith on and like ask them this question I'm like yeah slow down because they were bombarding me with questions uh one of the questions they wanted to ask you was uh what was your favorite uh titans game that you ever called I, i'm uh i have one in mind but let, let's hear yours. Let's hear if I'm right. Well, everyone thinks it's the miracle game. Okay, that's what he, yep. Okay, it's it's actually not. Okay. So let me specify, that's my favorite ending. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite moment. Okay. But the game itself, I was terrible. <laughs> I mean, I was horrendously bad. And so I was having a really rough time for the majority of that day just couldn't get it right and so that game is not my favorite and I think we did okay on the end but the game itself eh, my favorite game is beating New England in the 2019 playoffs and that's my favorite game because uh, we called a pretty good game on Titans radio we had a pretty good night our whole crew was really on and that always feels good professionally mm -hmm. but the other part of it was we ended the Tom Brady, Bill Belichick run. And that was 10 years after they had beaten us up there 59 to nothing. Yeah. That was 13 years after they had put us out of the playoffs. Uh, won the last game of the regular season. We would, uh, we, would be, we would have gone to the playoffs and they put in Vinny Testaverde and left touchdown pass at the end and just didn't leave a very good taste in my mouth. Every experience that I had ever had with them was bad until we beat them in 2018. And then, you know, we beat them in the playoffs in 2019. And you knew from talking with people up there in the know that this was it for Brady and Belichick together, mm -hmm. that this it was over. Now, nobody said it at the time, but the people who knew, no. that's what they were telling us. And when Logan Ryan intercepted the pass and scored the touchdown, you're like, did that just happen? Because you're like, we've beaten them. It's over. Even when we down the punt at the one. I agree. I still. You're not, you're not convinced it's over because it's Tom Brady. Absolutely. And so to beat him, and then to see him go win the Super Bowl with the Bucs, it makes it even more special because you realize, I mean, we beat the GOAT. Yeah. We put the GOAT out. We ended that run. Doesn't mean that, I mean, maybe the Patriots will come back and win six more Super Bowls. I don't know. But in terms of them together and that whole thing, we ended it. And so that, that to me, from a history standpoint, is easily the most special. And – the fact that that in the next week, seeing all of the Titans fans who were there and that were also in Baltimore, mm -hmm. oh, man. I mean, that just, you know, I had to fight back tears at both places because, you know, our fans have been through a lot. We weren't very good for a long time. Absolutely. But, you know, we stunk it up a couple of years. And – um I mean, going five and 27, and then Amy Adams Strunk comes in, and uh, we start doing things very differently as an organization, and she hires John Robinson, and, you know, I mean, eventually we hire Mike Vrabel. I mean, it's just been really, really good to see what we've been able to do, and 
you get a sense we're in the middle of something special right now. And when you have that, you really have to appreciate it because you're going to have ebbs and flows. You just are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was almost like I kind of saw what really kind of opened my eyes where I'm like, man, this could be something like, this could be something great is when the Predators went to the Stanley Cup and you saw downtown Nashville and how packed it was for every game. I go, if they could transfer those people into Titan fans or even that, just have that energy because that energy was crazy. Just to have that for Titan fans, it's, it's going to be amazing. I mean, that's, and that's what you want to have, you know, as a fan base. You want everyone to stick together and you want to have everyone kind of united. And then, like you said, everyone united in the, the Patriots game, everyone united. They all went to Baltimore and you saw how many fans. It's, it's awesome to see. And it's really, especially for this organization, for this fan base, um, it's something that we deserve, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we saw it in the early years, but I think some people thought, you know, we went 61 games the first five years as the Titans. So I think there's an assumption that it's just going to roll on like this forever. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't. I mean, the league is built for parity. And they, they pull you back. Because, you know, it's like where we have been in this offseason with the salary cap, people are like, why are we tight against the salary cap? It's like because we've had five straight winning seasons. Yeah. And we kept Kevin Byard, and we kept Taylor Lewan, and we kept Derrick Henry, and we kept Ben Jones, uh, and we kept Ryan Tannehill. And when you do that, you know, when you, when you re-sign these players, then that's going to mean you're going to be tighter. Yeah. When you're not very good, you don't have to worry about it. The, the good thing that John Robinson had done and has done is he's not burdened us with a lot of dead cap room. So we were able to make moves that allowed us to have some flexibility so far in this offseason. And yet he's had to be creative because we're good. Yeah. And when you're good, the cap is set up to force you to lose players. And, you know, that's been the case. Uh, I mean, again, it, it's business is business, you know. Got and, it. Um, what do you think the window is for, for the Titans? I think it's like almost like a – we were talking about it. I think it's like almost like a three-year window. I mean, we have Derrick Henry for how long? Tannehill. You know, you keep those core players and stuff. There's only – like you said, it's flexible. It goes up and down and stuff. What do you think our, our run – as long as you have a quarterback, the window is totally open. And that was the part, you know, Mariota was just never consistent enough. I wanted him to be. And I think I, we all did. I, yeah, I mean, everybody was pulling for him, and he was a guy who had, had done – he did some good things for us. Unfortunately, he went backward. And that was the part of it that I could never quite figure. After 2018 – I was thinking to myself, okay, I don't know what this becomes because he's got to play better in 2019. And then, you know, he, he plays a good game to open the 2019 season and we win. And you're like, well, we're all right. Well, then he plays poorly in back-to-back -back games. And so you're, you're thinking, okay, this is it. And then we go to Atlanta and he plays well. And you're like, okay, great, you know. <laughs> and then – Against Buffalo, he plays poorly. And then against, you know, Denver, he gets off to the bad start. And then you put in Tannehill. And from the point Tannehill has come in, and it's not easy to say because you don't – no one wants to speak badly of Marcus. Absolutely. But, but Ryan has far exceeded what his performance ever was. And when you're getting quarterbacking like what we're getting, as long as you have that, the window is open forever and ever. Because what you see is when you have a quarterback, you always have a chance. You can put different pieces around them. And, and I mean no, I mean nothing towards Derek because Derek's the best running back in the league and he's a part of our attack. But if you've got a quarterback who's throwing 33 touchdown passes and seven interceptions and completing 70% of his passes or something crazy like that, 
you can win. Yep. And, and that's what's so exciting about where we are right now. Definitely. So as long as Tannehill is doing Tannehill things, I, I think we've got a chance to be in every game, in every season. And, you know, the whole thing, and, and it's what the, the Bucks showed this year. You just got to get in the tournament and get hot. Two, then, years yep. ago, two years ago, we got in the tournament and got hot. You know, for yep. the majority of the first half of the Kansas City game, we were out playing them. And, you know, we're basically, if we win the second half of that game, we go to the Super Bowl. Last year, we get to the playoffs, and we're kind of out of gas. We're beat up. Um, you know, we've just – we've done all we can, but that's it. You you want to win enough games to get into the tournament, yes, but the main thing you want to be is hot when you get there. Yeah, I was telling people, like, a lot of people were stuck on the 9-7, nine 9-7, and 9-7. and, seven, nine and seven. I remember talking to Jim Wyatt. I go, I'd rather get 9-7 and seven, but make it further in than – then when I mean it's yeah it's nice to win a AFC uh, like you know South but look we got bounced out the first round. Like, I well, it's funny because so I was talking to Bob Soshi who is the play, play guy for the Patriots after the 2019 season and he he's, he's really an insightful guy and he said you guys don't look like a nine and seven team. I said well Bob I said we're really not. I said we're really a seven and three team. Because that's our that's our record with Tannehill. Yeah, Tannehill went on. Yep. And I, I said, so that when you're talking to your fan base, that's what you have. And then we go into Baltimore the next week. We're really an eight and three team. Mm-hmm. You know, we're really not the the ten and seven team. And I think that difference is what is what factored in. It's just like last year when we get into the playoffs. Are we an eleven and five team, or we are? Are we a team that started five and zero, oh and then finished eleven and five? Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, it was written. Now, listen, I'll take eleven and five every year. Yeah. Every year, complaint. But it, it's really about how you do it. You want you want to be making your run like the Bucks were at the end. You know, the Bucks were an eleven and five team, just like we were, but. They were the best team at the end, including the Chiefs. I mean, they beat the Chiefs up. Mm-hmm. And you you want to be able to stay hot. Uh, as long, long as we got Tannehill, I think we have that chance. I really do. I, I'm excited. That, that's true. And, and, and I remember the, the Bucks defense were not even top 10, but in the playoffs, they showed up. The Bucks yeah. defense showed up, and they helped. I mean, Tom Brady when he when he needed it, and they collect. And, and that, and like you said, that that's what you need is is the both sides of the ball to work together. Not only, yeah, we did good the regular season. It's almost like um like postseason baseball. Yeah, you could have a, a great record, but you you know it's completely different when it gets to the playoffs. Completely different. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. By the way, Yankees need a bullpen. And to stay uh, healthy, stay healthy. We need to yeah. stay healthy. Sorry, yeah. I don't mean to bring it. Some I, I mean, good news this week about that, as a matter of fact. So that's... <laughs> we'll see what happens. But okay, right, right back to Titan talk. Sorry about that. I just had to throw that in there because I was something that was in the pop, top of my head. Um, another question my uh, one of my buddies had was, uh, he said, "Ask him how special was it to call a Super Bowl." And does he think he'll he'll ever call another one? Oh yeah, I'm gonna call a Super Bowl win. There we go. I'm not just gonna call another Super Bowl. I'm gonna call a Super Bowl win. Nice. nice. That's. I, I mean, I'll tell you, that's my number one goal in broadcasting. Period. Yeah. It, um, it, it. I mean, it's really special. It's special to say you've done it. Um. It's special to say you've done it in a game that was a great football game. It's one of the greatest Super Bowls in terms of drama. Yes, sir. But at the same time, I want to call a win. Absolutely. I want to go back and I want to win. I want to see my team, you know, under the confetti, uh, hoisting the trophy, doing all of those. I, I want to. I want to see that, and I honestly believe with where our organization is right now, we're going to do that. And it starts with Amy Adams Strong because we have the right leadership 
she and Kenneth and Barkley Adams and their mother, Susan Lewis, and that ownership team that we have, their level of commitment is such that we will have everything we need to be able to win a championship. And it starts at the top. You, you don't luck into that. Nope. That's the one thing I've learned for sure. You may luck into it with how you're playing at the end of the year, or you may luck into it because the ball bounces. But you're only in the position to have that kind of good fortune if you have taken the time and done it all the right way. And they, they are doing all of the right things to give us a chance. Yep, definitely. I think it's um, our front office has been the strongest it's ever been mm-hmm. since, since, I, since I remember. Again, when I was little and stuff, I didn't really pay, te- pay attention too much of general manager and stuff like that. But, you know, as I got older, you know, you pay attention to stuff like that. And um, it's, it's interesting uh, where uh, she's led us. And it's, it's nothing but positive, man. It's nothing but positive. And that's what we can look forward uh, like I always tell people, I'm like it's people are like, oh, the Titans, uh, when like getting Cowboy fans, oh, when's the last time you won a chip? But you know what? It's it's a good time to be a Titans fan. It, sure. It's, it's not something where, you know, like you're like, oh, Titans, yeah. Well, three teams have five straight winning seasons. Three teams, and we're one. Of them. And when you do that, you're in the mix. I mean, the Chiefs have been the best team five years if you put five years together they've been the best team how many Super Bowls have they won oh no that's how hard it is to do it you know there was a period that Tom Brady went 10 years between winning Super Bowls ten years. as great as the Patriots were mm-hmm. They, they, didn't, they didn't win a Super Bowl for 10 years. And then, you know, they had won three in a four-year period, and then they came back and they won three in a five-year period, I think it was. It's hard, man. It, I mean, it is, it is just like the difference between the 2019 Titans and the 2020 Titans. When you're playing well, what your injuries look like, how the ball bounces, the yeah. only thing you can control is to be in the mix. And if you're in the mix, I mean, one of these years, maybe we'll go 16 and 0 and then end up 19 and 0 and win it all. Okay, maybe that happens. Or maybe we go 10 and 6, get in and get hot and win the whole thing. Maybe that happens. Or maybe it's something in between. It can be at a time where it's expected, it can be at a time where it's not expected. Who knows? Mm-hmm. What you, but what you understand is you've got to be in the mix. If you're six and ten, you ain't in the mix. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're eight and eight, you're not in the mix. Having a winning season gives you a chance, and that's you know that's what our number one goal is. I, I like the the playing under under the radar. That's always been kind of like the the Titans uh, go to thing. It was always let everyone else talk. Again, the media when. We beat the Patriots. So it was, oh, what did the Patriots do to lose that game? It was never, hey, the Titans actually played a really good game. Never that. Baltimore, oh, what did Lamar Jackson do? Lamar Jackson must – it was never the Titans, which it, it could be frustrating. And I bet you the players and the media and, and stuff like that would probably get frustrated too. But I've, we've done this so many years on and off that they've kind of counted us out and never talk about us in the media that I'm kind of used to it now. So it's like almost like a little bit more motivation for, for Titan fans and, and Titan players. So I like, I like going under, under the do 10 and six, not everyone's talking about us. And then we just like, like um, a couple of years back when we made it all the way to the, to the chiefs like that, that's something where you can, you can feel it. Something's brewing and you know, something's and everyone's counting each other down and everyone's talking about the other team. I like that. I like those. Those are the, the moments I like. There you go. But, um, Mike, what do you think about uh, free agency? What, what, what about the offense? What about the defense? Again, we lost a couple key players in defense, but again, uh, um, the salary cap and stuff like that, which is understandable. We lost Malcolm Butler, Dory Jackson. Um, what do you think about the free agents so far that we picked up? Um, who do you think is the most positive or will make the biggest impact uh, for the Titans? 
I thought we would have to cut several guys like what we had to cut. Uh, none of the cuts surprised me. Uh, none of the guys that signed with other places surprised me because I thought there were going to be some pieces that had to be pulled out. What has surprised me is how active John has been and what he has gotten done. I mean, on the first day of free agency, you have John U. Smith signed with the Patriots. Corey Davis. And Corey Davis signed with the Jets. And you're like, ah, boy, that's not bad. But you knew it was coming. Yeah. Because we already pay, we, we pay a running back exactly the same amount of money on paper that John U. Smith got. Most teams don't pay a running back. Gotcha. But we do, which is what we should do, because we have the best running back in ball. Well, if you pay a running back, you're not paying a tight end that kind of money. You just can't. No. Nope. Choice. Yep. So good for Janu. Good that he gets to go somewhere and make more dough. Good person. Good player. Happy for him. Hope he never beats us. But you we know, play. We play him though. <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, that's. I mean, but it, that that for him mm -hmm. is as a as a human being, you're happy. He earns. Of course. Corey's the same thing. Here's the problem. Corey's not our number one receiver. Nope. A.J. Brown is. Nope. Guess who we got to pay next offseason? A.J. Brown. So those two things, no surprise. But on the same day, we agreed to terms with Danico Autry and Bud Dupree. Now, so at the end of the day, one of my buddies, huge fan, oftentimes very negative, <laughs> calls me to yell at me. He calls me that day. He goes, I got to tell you something. He goes, I think if you traded those two players for the two we got, he said, I think we're better. I'm like, yep. You got two pass rushers. You had no pass rush last year, 19 sacks. You got two pass rushers. And now you're in a situation where you're going to be able to find a tight end somewhere in the market. You're going to be able to find a receiver somewhere in the market. You're all, you didn't lose your number one receiver. No. You know, you've got a superstar number one receiver for the first time probably since Derek Mason. And you, and you still got him. And they're, they're veteran receivers out there, and it's a great draft for rookie receivers. You can't find Bud Dupree and Danico Autry. In the draft. In the draft. They're not there this year. Absolutely. Now, maybe there are some guys that will end up being that good. Of course, neither one of those players were that good when they came into the league. Absolutely. So you you got better. And I think as you have you seen what we've added? We had Josh Reynolds, we had Kevin Johnson, mm -hmm. we had Kendall Lamb, we we had uh, Ola Daney from Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, as these pieces continue to come to us, you're like, oh, this is interesting. John's done a lot more than I thought he would. And because I thought he would, I thought he would wait till the draft move. And then I thought he would do more free agency after the fact. I mean, he's brought it, man. I mean, he has just brought it. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people, again, a lot of people like to criticize this and that. I remember, again, that's why I try not to go on social media a lot and stuff like that, just because it's so negative and stuff. Regardless, if you sign a good player or a bad player, they still have something bad to say, you know? I'm like, come on. like. So I always said from the very beginning, always trust the process, trust John Robinson. He hasn't – the only thing where he had a little hiccup was the, the, the Isaiah Wilson. That's the only – that was the, the, the biggest hiccup. And, again, True. you can't – again, we don't know what the, you know, what the scouting saw in, in Isaiah Wilson and stuff like that. Maybe he was, like, you know, up to date and he was good. And then, I mean, some people just fall apart once they get the money and stuff. I mean, we don't know. Well, you have to go with the overall batting average. Okay. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. And John Robinson has an excellent overall batting average in free agency and in the draft. But, you know, Belichick didn't get them all right. No. Parcells didn't get them all right. You know, Vince Lombardi didn't get them all right. I mean, you, you go on and on, and you can't, you can't know everything. You have to have a formula and have a process, and then go with that formula and that process and trust it. And then what you come out with is a batting average. 
But are you going to have big hits? Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. Henry in the second round, he's one of the greatest second round picks in the history of the NFL. In the history of the NFL. That's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, you're talking about a guy who is on a Hall of Fame path. And since the Hall of Fame has been the Hall of Fame, less than 40 second round picks have made the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's, that's absolutely nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. So, so if you want to throw the negative, mm -hmm. I can throw that at you. And you can say, well, okay. And, and that's what you have to go with. And, you know, for the John Robinsons of the world, I mean, if you think Bob in Memphis or Fred in Knoxville or Tim in Nashville beat up John Robinson, John Robinson beats up John Robinson worse than anybody. Mm -hmm. Harder on himself. But what he knows to be true is he's got to stick with his process and he's got he's to work his formula and then let the chips fall where they may. And overall, his batting average has been excellent. If you look at where we are right now, with five straight winning seasons, the, the only pieces that he didn't draft or sign or acquire somehow are Taylor Lewan and Daquan Jones. Yep. So that. He, he's built it. I mean, so you want to counter – something that doesn't work, talk to me about getting Ron Tannehill for a fourth round pick. Exactly. Yeah. And people are still complaining about that though. That's well, but that, but the, the whole thing is, and that's okay. That's okay. I'm not criticizing anybody for, for being critical. I, I don't tell any fan what they should think and what they shouldn't think. That's, that's your, that's your business. I'm just glad you're a fan. Yep. And if you're positive or you're negative or in the middle, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's your business. I'm, I'm not one of these who's sitting here going, don't, you shouldn't do yeah. that. What I am saying is having worked down the hall from him, having spent a lot of time with him, having worked with Floyd Reese and Mike Reinfeld and Rustin Webster, a lot of talented people, a lot of talented people in scouting and in personnel, you, you understand what the approaches are. Gotcha. And if you if you see and and what John has put into place, largely through Amy, because Amy has spent so much money on football and so much money on uh, really technology, I think is the best way to say it. And it's one of the reasons that we were ready to take on a pandemic year because John and his staff had really done a lot with our infrastructure and our technology. Okay. That was Amy. You know, Rustin worked for different owners. Amy has worked with, she worked with Rustin at the end of his tenure, but you know, John's been her guy. And she has given John the tools to succeed. He'll be the first to say, I have an owner who wants to win, and when I tell her this will help us win, she does. She goes for it. Yep. That, that, you know, back to the Yankees analogy under Steinbrenner, that's a big deal. So <laughs> you, do you, you do the best you can. You know, you understand that they're not all going to be pro football Hall of Famers. They're not all – every trade's not going to work. Some of them are going to leave you scratching your head because, you know what, they're human beings. Exactly. And, they're, and when you hand human beings fame, money, and free time, things change. Absolutely. So, it's human nature. It's human nature. That's right. That's what happens. But all right, man. Um, well, last thing I want to say was uh, thank you for uh, – we'll get you wrapped up. Uh, I want to appreciate, appreciate you coming on. And, and oh, yeah. Some time My pleasure. Um, again, like I said, I don't like wasting anyone's time. Again, time is something you never get back, but I, I did have a, a great, great time just listening to your stories and catching up on some Titan football, especially, uh, with all the free agency and stuff like that going on, man. Well, I've enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, the, the part, as I said earlier in the conversation is I'm glad somebody wants to talk to me. <laughs>
<laughs> because at, at the point where we started, and you, you just don't forget it. I, I think the one advantage that I had when I came to work for the Titans, we were in trailers on what is parking lot M, um, right by the Juvenile Justice Center when we were building Nissan Stadium. And in, in that time, as we're doing this thing, um, we just used to think, man, someday we're going to be big time. Someday everybody's going to be interested in the Titans. We can't wait for that day. And um, it's happened. And I'm very thankful for that. And just don't forget where we came from. Absolutely. Came from Houston and we, we went to Memphis. We played at Vanderbilt. We were the Oilers. And we had a nice history before we got here. Mm-hmm. The real golden age of the franchise has, has occurred, you know, while we've been here, the Super Bowl appearance and all the, you know, all the playoff appearances, which have just been fantastic. I mean, we've, we've gotten to go to the playoffs quite a bit yeah. um, since the ball club came here. I think what now nine times and you just you just don't take anything for granted you enjoy the moments and you realize how fortunate you are and you just hope it doesn't stop and that's that's what I'm hoping for but I'm going to tell you I'm going to call the Titans winning a Super Bowl absolutely I, I, I have, have it. I have it it's right gonna, here it's gonna happen there we go telling you that's the only <laughs> prediction I'll make I don't know when <laughs> I, hope, I hope it's soon but that is going to happen Absolutely, Mike Keith. That's and we can't wait to hear you say touchdown Titans and, and all those 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 great moments, man. Thank you. But, but I do again, like I said, I do appreciate it, and I, I hope you have a great day, buddy. Thanks for. Having-